Welcome back to Razmafsar TV. Today I'm going to talk about a topic and I'm sure that many of you have been waiting for this. One of the eras of Iranian history I am especially interested in and I have done lots of research in this field. It means Sassanid era, arms and armor from Sassanid era. Just recently, I have published with a friend of mine, with a colleagues of mine, um, on Sassanid armor, which was published on, in a peer review journal. And also, I, uh, pu we published years ago with my colleague and research colleague, Pete Dwyer, about Sassanid archery. And we are going to publish many more. The good thing about us is that we practice martial arts and as such, by, by practicing martial arts, we are able to um, do analysis on um, arms and armor, which are with inferring, with relying on to, inferring to, relating to, and also relying on information from real training in armor. We know what it works, what it doesn't work. And this is extremely important, and especially also for swords. If you only rely on paintings, I don't know, stone reliefs, without handling real deals, um, like as I did in museums, or with um, measuring them, having them in your hands, and then having reproduction made, authentic reproductions for fighting, you will not be able to know and to, to know what it works, what it doesn't. It is like someone tries to tell you how boxing works or how jiu-jitsu works and they never wrestled and did grappling or boxing. You know that it does not work. The same applies to arms and armor. And that's why we need to cooperate. Not everyone needs to do martial arts or historical swordsmanship and armored combat. Some people are researchers, that's fine. But then you need to work with people who practice these things, or both of them, or just one or the other, but work in a team. And that's what is extremely important. Having said that, let me just go and uh, talk about something and a topic today, which is extremely important. And it is about uh, Sassanid swords. Okay, let me just see what we can uh, do about Sassanid swords, what Sassanid swords are all about. Um, please remember, I handled many authentic and historical Sassanid swords as other uh, arms and armor in my hands. I analyzed, measured the Sassanid swords in the um, National Museum of Iran, Iran Museum Iran Bastan, Museum Milli, Museum Iran Bastan. And uh, also uh, analyze Sassanid swords in Reza Abbasi Museum. And uh, also analyze Sassanid swords in major private collections in Iran and in major private collections outside Iran. I'm going to show you these Sassanid swords, which are published in uh, three uh, books of mine. And I'm going to show them. If you need, I'll give you some information on them. If you need detailed information as far as the measurements are concerned, I would really like to ask you to uh, buy my books and you can also this way support my research and then uh, buy my books and then um, read them. But for now, I'm going to share something with you. I mean, a file with you. So you're going to see uh, Sassanid source I analyzed. I'm going to give you a short introduction. In my book, I also analyze, or in my articles later on, the development of Sassanid swords, which means um, I explain them based on stone reliefs, but stone reliefs give you just some information. As I mentioned, you never know to what extent stone, stone reliefs or silver coins or uh, silver trays uh, portray something. As Beat always says, as far as miniatures are concerned, <laughs> he has a very good saying. Guys, this is not a photograph. It's not a camera. This is done via artistic conventions. Sometimes artistic conventions 
are based on earlier periods, which keeps going. We never know. Sometimes we know, sometimes we don't. Just think about Jalarid um, miniatures, which were kept being made also in Timurid era, right? And also further on. So, but still, they provide us interesting information. That's why stone reliefs, all those things, give you some information, then you need authentic sorts, and then you need also to have reproduction and fight with them to have a comprehensive analysis of arms and armors. And this is true not only for Sassanid swords, this is true for any type of sword, this is true for any type of arms and armor. Now, let me share this file with you. And then when I share this file with you, then we are going to see what I exactly mean. So let me just see. Okay, I'm going into presentation modus. Here you go. Okay, Sassanid swords, in which books of mine you can go and read about Sassanid swords. This is in my first book, Arms and Armor from Iran, The Bronze Age to the End of the Qajar Period, published in 2006. Other Sassanid, I never in my, like, in my books repeat, you know, I remember a person uh, uh, tried to review my lexicon and he completely, you know, in the haste to give a review of my lexicon, he completely forgot that the items which are in my lexicon in the catalog are completely different from arms and armor from Iran. So just to all my fans, all my supporters, and all uh, uh, the buyers of my books in catalogs, I never repeat an item. So then Sassanid Swords uh, published in lexicon of arms and armor from Iran. And then there are also uh, jewel in the new book of mine, jewels and patterned crucibles still. You see that, I mean, in my first book, Arms and Armor from Iran, uh, Jewels and, uh, okay, excuse me, I just forgot, Lexing of Arms and Armor from Iran is published in 2010. Jewels and Patterned Crucible Steel is published just, I mean, was published, is published, has been published this year, 2020, uh, 2021. So, so Arms and Armor from Iran uh, was published 2006, Lexing of Arms and Armor from Iran 2010, and Jewels and Patterned Crucible Steel 2021. Let me just not go on. In my first book, Arms and Armor from Iran, you can see uh, an analysis of Sassanid swords. And there you can see, I mean, also based on Messiah, and I added more items to that, you can see the development of Sassanid swords. Of course, um, and you can see how the Sassanid swords uh, were developed. But we just say early Sassanid swords were hang, uh, hung, excuse me, via uh, scabbard slide system. What is scabbard slide system? You see that the, the sword is hanging, right? You see that vertically in front of the body of the warrior where he's putting his hand there, and then, or it goes to the side, but mostly it's in the middle or it goes to the side, but is ma mainly and basically it is, is a vertical. The question for us is, okay, if you, are sitting on a horseback and it's vertically there, it's going to be mostly like this, also vertical or diagonal because of the pressure maybe because the way the, the scabbard um, gets in touch with the saddle or whatever, right? Later development, which you can see also on, uh, you know, you see that on the later and you see that's the scabbard slide system uh, later, I mean, which I don't show it here, but in my book you can see some of the few of the Sassanid stone reliefs show P-shaped scabbard, where the uh, uh, scabbard um, attachment, where the, there are two of them, I'm going to show it to you, and then the Sassanid swords can be hung uh, horizontally. I'm going to explain that more later, but let me just move. Information also you need this the early scabbard slide system. On the left, you see that Sassanid silver coin also always give us, not always, but many of them have this, uh, some of them have the spear or the lance trident, and some of them have this um, sword, right? Um, let me just go ahead. And also, as we see it here, on a 
Sassanid silver trade. You see again, what it's interesting for us, you see that it is always a straight sword, possibly or most probably double-edged, straight, and a cross, a cross guard. You see that it looks like, um, like medieval European swords, one-handed European swords. I'm not talking about two-handed, one-handed. I mean, two-handed, like long, long swords have also this cross guard. But we don't go in that direction. Let's stay here and talk about that. So you see that it is um, hung here, also vertically scab scabbard slide system. So you see, so it has a cross. If you take a look at that here on silver coins, some of them you see very faint cross. Some of them it's hard to see because silver coins, you know, they're not as exact as a silver tray. But here, when you come here, you see that the cross are really visible. Some of them also, the terminals of the cross change, right? In different shapes. This is another issue I'm not going into detail. Again, in my books, you can read about that or in my upcoming uh, publications, I'm going to write more on that. This is a Sassanid sword from National Museum of Iran, Museum Iran Bostan. Uh, two of them and both of them, the details are there. Both of them are excavated. You can see um, the name of archaeological team and archaeologists who they did that. And one of them is 80.5 centimeter, one of them is 81.5. These are clearly early Sassanid swords with a cross, right? Guard, excuse me, with a cross guard. And handle, as usual, is not there. It was um, most probably made of an organic material. We don't know which material, could have been horn, most probably could have been ivory, could have been anything which is not. Uh, was uh, perishable and is no longer there, right? So you can see it there. You see that? Please take a look at the cross guard here. And when we come back here, and um, you can see that here is there is a cross guard as well. Here, you have a bit of picture from Museum um, Iran Boston National Museum of Iran. I mean, I would like to especially thank Ms. Mahnas Gorji back then. Later on, she became head of the National Museum of Iran. Back then, she was the head of uh, um, conversation, uh, conservation, I'm sorry, conservation, and also, um, right, and who really personally took care of this sword to conserve it, right? Uh, right, so you can see this here, the sword. And here, also from National Museum of Iran, um, you know, remember, I, I would like to say something. This is stock, right, in the scabbard. So you, it's in the National Museum of Iran. This is silver, P-shaped scabbard. So let me just first talk about scabbard slide. Excuse me, not scabbard slide, P-shaped scabbard attachments. You see, it's like a P, uh, Latin P. Uh, so we don't know how they called it back then in Sassanid Iran, Iran maybe one day. We will have a Pahlavi script. You never know. I hope so. It's always you never give hope. But uh, as we say in um, English speaking um, uh, world, P shaped scabbard uh, attachments. And you see that they are um, going to use both of them. Later on, you see they uh, also, you go and see that later Shamshirs or whatever, um, they were also hanged white, not like a P shape, but the same system. So, uh, we don't know exactly where they come from because it is clear that Sassanids changed their system. Like in archery, remember we, we said that we believe that they did this typical finger uh, draw, we believe, right? And later on, we see that also thumb throw, which was possibly a military reform because of the altercation to the north, enemies in the north. And we also believe around the same time this scabbard um, slide system, which was vertically hung, was changed to horizontal to this one because you may have two uh, belts hanging, uh, two cords hanging from your belt, then the scabbard um, is horizontally hung from your belt. Now, the question is no matter if you are on horseback or if you are infantry, this is an advantage. For an infantry, clearly it is an advantage. Because once you are walking as an infantry, if you have a scabbard slide system, in order, right, 
first of all, people say it will hinder you when you walk. I don't believe it. I think you can put it to the side, right? As a fighter, and I'm saying that, and it's going to be next, dangling next to your, to your leg. And I can give you one example why. We have really large qaddare, right? Qaddare, or also large ghamez, which were hang also, which are hung only with one, right? But this is another, and this doesn't hinder you. But the thing is, they're on the side. Okay, they're longer than the large qaddare, but we have large qaddare, large ghamez fairly, which are as long as a sword. I personally don't think it hindered them. I think if it's horizontal, because you know they say, okay, because you see that read that in research, some of my colleagues, they need to constantly exercise pressure on the heels. Uh, so then it comes to a horizontal position and then walk. I don't think it's necessary, right? I believe if it's in the middle of your legs, yeah, of course, but you can just put it to the side. But what I believe, is the development came because you can draw the sword much faster. A horizontal sword, which is hanging horizontally, you can draw it faster. For a vertical, you cannot do it like this, a long sword, right? <laughs> Even if you could, right, it would take much more time to do that. And so this way is fast. So, okay, I did give it to my colleagues somehow for carrying advantage, but definitely, definitely faster in drawing. Now back to this. I would like to mention something to you, and this is going to be very interesting. This is silver. You cannot pull it out. This is 1,700 grams, right? This is an old sword. It went through oxidization, especially when you go to the metal in the middle, right? So it lose, it has lost weight. Now my message to those, uh, um, you know, I met a very nice colleague from animation. They all believe that. Um, they were light. No, Sassanid swords are not light, right? So you see that. This is also a thing when you get this um, wrong image, when you only rely on reliefs, when you only rely on um, pictures, right? Without, without handling that. So 1,700 grams and total length is 100. Mind you, this is in scabber. So be careful here. We go uh, from Musée Iran Boston, National Museum of Iran, another sword. And as you can see, as you can see, this sword, right? This sword is also P-shaped scabbard system. And then you see that one of the P-shapes is unfortunately destroyed, but it's also silver, right? And uh, this is silver. And please take a look at that. You see that, you see the feather pattern. We believe this is Varakh. This is Seymour. This was something to protect them. Later on during Islamic period, we have different Quranic inscriptions or also prayers, or also poems to protect the warrior or also Piro Hanifat, victory shirt. We believe uh, back then this Varak or you see, read it in my books re regarding all these things, symbols and symbolism of Sassanid Sert was there to protect the warrior. If you go there and you cannot believe it, when I had them in my hand, how the lib delicate each feather was there, was made, and each feather differs from the other. It's not that they punched it, right? So, and interesting on one side, you see the feather pattern, on one side, it, it does. The question which I, oh, I'm always asked, some people think wrongly, all scabbard, uh, Sassanid swords with scabbard, P-shaped scabbard attachments have um, feather patterns. No, that's not correct. Please look at this one. This one doesn't, right? And it says these golden circles, but I will come back to that later, what these circles mean, it's interesting. It is this one. And now, uh, the total weight of that, everything together, okay, it's broken, is, uh, is everything is, um, but imagine and remember the oxidization process, as I mentioned that, but still it weighs 1,350 grams. I repeat, 1,350 grams. And the total length is 106.5 centimeters. Now, let me see. If I can show it to you, yes. Please look at them here in this picture. I hope that 
when I move my mouse, you can see that, you see the circles? It is like a circle, like a silver wire going like that. You see the same pattern on Yemenite Jambia of today even, of 19th century, 18th century, 19th, even 20th century. That's a fascinating thing, the same thing, but this is something else. I think on my channel, I'll show one of these Yemenite Jambias with Janabia, as the, our Arab colleagues call it. Now look at the circles here. You can see it again here. Let me just say that something about that. In Musea Iran Boston, they have this sort, they said very, very early Islamic period belonged to a Sassanid uh, fighter who was in the beginning, you know, that they served the Abbasid, for example. I, just, I mean, this is a Sassanid sword. And uh, if it belonged to the early Sassanid period, we don't know. I believe it's again, Sassanid period. But let me just say some things about this sword. I remember one day, one person told me that these swords were not for fighting. Absolutely not correct. They are absolutely made for fighting, like the others you saw. The shape of the handle, you see that there is a, there is a rectangular part and you can, the balance is excellent on this sword. And the shape of the handle is very practical because it comes here, big shape. And together with Dr. Toshkin, we wrote an academic scientific article in an academic journal about these Karab, Kar, Kar, Karabella hilts, right? You know that bit you can see in Persian, on Ottoman, on Polish, later on sabers, this Karabella hilt. Look at this. This is a big shape, clearly a big shape. In that article, we didn't refer to it, but it is something we are going to elaborate on that later. Look at the big shape. And the interesting part for it is this. All these big shapes have behind the handle of them two circles, right? And uh, two, excuse me, two rings, right? And these rings were clearly made for passing a cord, possibly a leather cord, through them. And then your hand comes, so a leather cord fixes or attaches, excuse me, attaches the handle here. And then you have the beak shape coming here and then here. So if you hit extremely hard, then the sword can, if you lose the sword, you can flip it and it comes back in your hand. Remember, most shamshirs from later period have the same, with a different system, not with rings. They have an attachment, right? They have an attachment above the bull chow, above the shamshir cross guard, and then it comes a handle made of leather, which you pass your hand through it. Most shamshirs had that, but during the uh, course of time, most of them lost it, of those leather strap. But you see that this is the same concept, beak shaped and this. And this, um, the interesting part is, and I say this as a fighter and someone who handled this sword, again, not from pictures, for those of you who want to reproduce it. The interesting part about this rectangular part is that it, it works like a pommel, but not here because it doesn't have a pommel. I mean, it does, it's like a beak shape, but here. So it makes sure that the weight is not going to be completely tip heavy, but some weight is here and it functions in a very interesting way that you have not the big pommel here, but here, and it doesn't make your sword tip heavy. This is something, a very ingenious invention, right? And I would like for those of you who want to reproduce this sword, please contact me and I will help you because I want this sword to be reproduced, a real one, which can be used for test cutting and also for sparring, you know, the sharp one for full contact uh, and combat. So this is something which we need to take into consideration. Okay. So this was 92 centimeter long from uh, Musee Iran Boston National Museum of Iran. You see that they're all in my book, Arms and Armor from Iran. And this is from, uh, this one is from Reza Abbasi Museum. Now look. This, you could pull it out of the scabbard, but this one at Reza Abbasi Museum is stock, right? But please take a look at them. Both of them have feather pattern of Varag, Seymour, and they have that like silver wire uh, circle, right? You see that? The other one as well. You see that? 
feather pattern and the silver wire. But the interesting part about the Sassanid sword and almost the same 92, this one is 92 centimeters, this one is 92.3. But the interesting thing for us is the following. Please take a look at this, right? Please take a look at this and see that on this um, rectangular part, you see two inserted stones, most probably a gate or carnelian, very beautiful things and stones. And now we go ahead here. There is a very interesting one also excavated can find the information there is a 200 Sassanid sword, 117 centimeters. Unfortunately, most of its parts are gone. It is, you see that a bit curved, but I'm sure it was not curved originally. It's too long and during, during the course of time or pressure in the, uh, where it was found, made it uh, curved a bit, as you can see it here. But you see that the blade would have been like tapering towards a tip. The interesting thing has disc. One disc is here. Then there is a, a cross guard, small cross guard, and another one longer here. So you can hold it really like a, like a long sword. Please remember, we have similar also to the later period, to the 18th century, 19th century, similar, not similar in shape, but two handed. I mean. Um, used in India, in Hindustan, right? But this is an old one and a very, very, very beautiful one, right? You see that the circle again here, if you can see the mouse, you see here? And interestingly, I'm going to show you, it's 117, but there are also examples which could have been used by one hand, but they're again, uh, two-handed. Now we go to my lexicon. And in this lexicon or lexicon of arms and armor from Iran, this is from a private collection in Iran. This is the handle of it. On one side, let's say on the obverse side, it is gold with feather pattern. On the reverse side, it is silver. Isn't it beautiful? silver cover because possibly they had wooden handle or wooden scabbard then this um, silver um, sheet was covering or covered the scabbard and then the handle and you see clearly on this the holes and these holes were for passing the rivets two rivets through the tank this is magnificent and you see also the p-shaped scabbard attachment on the left if you can take a look at this right here, see that? And here is on top of the handle. One thing I forgot to mention, back to this one. You see this example with the beak shape and this one, they don't have any p shape attachment. What we assume is they were tucked in a belt, right? They were tucked in the belt because even you can, they don't have a scabbard slide system. You see how interesting it is? And again, some are not only hung on the side that you have an attachment, some of them also tucked in the shawl up to the late Qajar period. See that here, you can see the, I mean, this is only the handle and one P-shaped scabbard attachment, but such a beautiful work. You can see it in my uh, book, Lexicon of Arms and Armor from Iran. I have more pictures of it, of these two, which you can see also in the lexicon. Here you can see the feather pattern clearly, the beauty of it. Here I'm going to show you another uh, uh, Sassanid sword. This is also from a private collection in Iran. Total length of it is 106.5. Total weight without scabbard is 1,599 grams. 
the total weight with scabbard is 1,957. Now again back, 1,599 in spite of oxidization of the sword without scabbard. That's heavier than other Shah Shamshir. Remember, it was 1,200 grams. So you can imagine what we are talking about. Really sturdy swords. And here, um, interesting thing about it is, do you see that? It doesn't have a feather pattern. Remember one from uh, National Museum of Iran, this one, where was that, excuse me? This one doesn't have a feather pattern. And this one also doesn't. So don't think all of them do have. It doesn't, it's a beautiful sword. You can see it here again. I believe this um, the second scabbard uh, attachment is um, is not in the right position. It has to be come down here almost, but it happened right during the course of time. It is beautiful, right? With its original point. And now look at this one. Remember that one? What I showed you? It's a bit shorter. It's from. Uh, Boniard Museum, Culture Institute of Boniard. This is there with the feather pattern. Again, with these two rings, you see that the same concept, big shape and a, a rectangular uh, part just at the, close to the fourth of the blade or just neighboring the neighboring era, area. So Sassanid sword, and this is 86.3 centimeters. Weight without scabbard, without scabbard is 855, the width scabbard is 347. Again, it has these rings for attaching the cord there. Here you can see clearly the feather pattern on that, right? And in my lexicon, I also show another Sassanid sword. Possibly, you see that it is shorter, not that short, but for a long sword, the other one was 116, if my memory doesn't fail me. Let me just see. 117, I'm sorry, centimeters. And here we have 80 centimeters. And this one weighs 806 grams. This is from a private collection. And this one, look at the silver inlaying as a decoration. Oxidization almost uh, destroyed it, but you can see the silver parts, which um, still decorate that. This, and here also on the, here you can see the silver inlayings. This is such a beautiful sword. And then we come to my last book for another Sassanid sword. Sword, excuse me. This is again with P-shaped scabbard uh, attachments. And this one is very interesting. Do you see that? This one had partial silver sheet covering the scabbard. The scabbard most probably again made of wood is perished. And you see that some, most of them had complete, but not all Sassanid sword have complete silver uh, sheet covering. This is also from a private collection in Iran. And you see that um, this is a P-shaped scabbard attachments here, right? This is a Sassanid blade. This is a, published in my new book, just recent book published this year, 2021. Jewels and Patterned Crucible Steel, right? Book of Jewels, uh, Stones and Medals. This is there. And here you can see more pictures uh, showing this sword. And so you can take a look at that. Again, I'm going to see just to the depth of my research in these three books. Uh, in my books, you can see uh, an analysis of stone reliefs also a bit of coins, swords are depicted. In my articles, you can read about them much more. Then this was the early which uh, sword, which was uh, hung via scabbard slide system. Two examples, you can see it here, excavated. Then these are uh, P-shaped scabbard attachments. This one, you see that this with gold, that's the ring we always talked about it. It's, it's with gold, so later on with silver wires. You see that? And then, this one with the rectangular part close. This is a beautiful one with the stones, uh, red stones there inside. And uh, this is a uh, Sassanid uh, two-handed sword. 
right? This is one handle and one P-shaped scabbard attachment. One side is gold, one side is silver. And the feather pattern, I explained, and I explained that all of them have feather pattern as this one, right? And this one was, again, that sword. I've shown three of them. Beautiful one. You see that feather pattern? And then 200 Sassanid swords. Smaller versions exist as well. And this was, I mentioned, not all Sassanid swords had this scabbard covered with a complete silver sheet or golden sheet. So examples of that they are covered, like I think in Metropolitan Museum of Art, I saw one also in a private collection once. I'm going to go to that country and make an analysis of that as well, hopefully soon. Then travels are possible again. You see that here is where this cord, leather cord was passed so you could hang it. So let me just get out of here. So I hope you enjoyed uh, today my presentation on Sassanid swords and uh, I've shown you different Sassanid swords and nothing compares to the original in your hand. Once you have original swords and I, you know, some, you know, I was invited to, to talk in front of MBA graduates and because um, a professor friend of mine from a leading elite university in Germany asked me to talk to them about my research and what drives me. And I explained to students, nothing is more important for me to have a king sword in your hand from Islamic period Iran, and especially when you come to ancient Iran. I cannot explain the feeling when you have a Sassanid sword in your hand. And I had tens of them, more. I don't know how many I had in my hands by far. I've shown you some of them which have been published in my books. I urgently ask you to go and read these books, to look at the measurements. If you want to reproduce them, please contact me. And uh, I will be happy to help you to reproduce the real deal as far as balance is concerned. So that something which you can be used for fighting, at least try to have an unsharpened one for fighting, right? Like in armored combat and have a sharpened one a reproduction to do cutting tests, to gain information, right? Imagine, I always say, for those of you who are into arms and armor study, if you don't have a reproduction of them and just write about them or just make a reproduction and don't fight with it or don't do cutting tests with them, it is like you have a bow, but you never shoot with it. So you never know if it works or it doesn't and how it works above all. These were Sassanid swords. I'm going to make more videos on armor, Sassanid armor. I'm going to make more videos on um, ancient Iran, starting from Luristan, Achaemenid period, Parthian swords, axes, whatever. But before doing that, I would like again to ask you, please support our, my channel. And your support, especially on YouTube, is extremely important. If you want to do it on Instagram, I appreciate that. But on YouTube, it's very, very important for me, for my research, and so on. Thank you very much for watching this channel. And I wish everyone a nice day. And thank you very much. Bye-bye.